Today, I wanted to talk about joy because even though joy is a topic I, I mention a lot, it's, uh, joy is, is so important when, you know, this kind of thing is happening. And if you already have acquired a habit of joy, it's easier to keep yourself not only on an even keel, but in a place of uh, important harmony and, and inner, inner uh, well-being. And if you haven't yet acquired a habit of joy, well, you know, this is what I want to talk about a little bit today. So uh, you need to understand that joy is a choice. Yes, you probably know this. Joy is a choice. Joy is also a habit. Uh, and joy changes your energy. All of those things, the fact that it's a choice, it's a habit, it changes your energy, I think are self-evident. But think about it also this way. Let's say I tend to think about the more negative things. So it's a little bit like talking about being a positive person or being a negative person. Except that in the case of joy, it's not just about seeing the glass as half full. Well, this is much more than half full. As more than seeing the glass as half full, it is also about feeling joy about the fact that I have the glass. I have not only the lovely crystal that holds the water, but I also have the water, maybe with some lemon in it. And uh, I am going to love the sensation of drinking it and feeling refreshed. And thinking in this way, making a habit of thinking in this way, not to mention some of the things you can do in order to acquire joy that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, means that you change some of your neural pathways bit by bit, not today, not the first day, but in time as it goes on. And these habits that you change um, might be the one where you think, oh, you know, I'm drinking water instead of something more interesting. Maybe you drink water instead of something more interesting that you would actually prefer because the more interesting thing is not as healthy for you as water, but you're still thinking that even though you're doing the good thing for your body. Um, I have to say a couple of times over the course of this pandemic, I've caught myself thinking about Coke. You know, I think, oh, I would love to have a Coke. And then I say, what? I mean, I haven't had Coke probably in 20 years. Um, although I used to be a big, big, big Coke drinker. So all I'm saying is you talk to yourself all day long about any manner of things and the more you are aware of what you talk to yourself about, the more you can begin to realize in how many of these situations you could be talking yourself into joy, so to speak. And another thing that is quite self-evident is that joy is not um, dependent on outer circumstances. I can be in a place of great joy, even if my outer circumstances aren't the best. And um, when you're creating habits, it means that w whether you're reacting in ways that um, are not good for you or if you are reacting in ways that are good for you, either way, you're creating a habit. But if you decide to create the habit in ways that are good for you, then of course, like I said earlier, the neural pathways begin to check. So if you're all begin to change. So if you're always checking your inner well-being with regards to whatever it is that's going on and whatever it is that's happening inside your head, you can tell whether you are in the process of, you know, getting some joy into your life. But I want to reiterate, and I'm sorry because I know I repeat this a heck of a lot. I want to reiterate the fact that joy is so inexpensive. It's so easy to have as long as you know what to look for. And if you haven't already done this at some point in the past, I recommend you sit down and make a list of the things that give you joy. So mine uh, tend to be the smell of freshly brewed coffee or the smell of newly mown lawns which I get a heck of a lot here when I go for my walk in the mornings because there's all these lovely gardeners out mowing the lawns for um, the, the people that live in the houses. And 
you know, one gardening company, truck, landscaper, or whatever, that's sitting outside one particular house might be the landscaper for six or seven houses around there. So uh, that smell of freshly mown grass, if he's already cut three or four of those houses, by the time I get there, is pervasive for almost an entire block. And it's just a smell I so much love, reminds me of childhood, makes me feel joy. Um, how about the feel of a very good breeze as you walk, uh, sorry, as you go, you're in the waves in your boat, going over the water? Or, or how about tasting something you enjoy? How about nachos with lots of cheese on them? Um, as you sit down to watch something you very much enjoy on TV, you know, tennis match, football game, whatever it is, remember that your uh, purpose isn't to make you burst into dancing and, 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 and uh, laughter, but to change the state of your inner energy. That's really the purpose of this. And it's a little bit like taking vitamins every day. Yeah, you, you take certain supplements every day because you have come to realize they're good for your body. Well, taking several doses of joy every day is also good for your body and your spirit and your heart and uh, your energy. And of course, if we go back to the thing I keep saying uh, over these uh, multiple sessions we've been sitting together, the state of your energy is how you co-create. The state of your energy is what adds or subtracts from the global energy or energetic frequency that we're all feeling. So this is, this is one of the ways you have of adding to that, but at the same time, making yourself feel really rather marvelous. Um, so uh, when, when anything in life gets you down, Remember that by using some strategies to feel joy, uh, it can change how you feel in that moment. So, you know, going back to the little things, so the little cup of coffee or the smell of the freshly mown grass or the taste of the nachos, and there's so many other examples, um, you know, back in the day when we were all still reading newspapers, I love to go to a cafe somewhere with a view to the beach, have my coffee, um, read my newspaper, and every so often glimpse over the top of my newspaper this wonderful view that I had in front, not to mention the sound of the waves. And, you know, not everybody necessarily lives by the seaside, but it doesn't matter where you live, you can find your own equivalent situation. And nowadays, of course, I don't read newspapers, I read mobile. <laughs> I read all my newspapers on the mobile. And it's not quite as pleasurable, I have to say, except for the fact that I can read instead of just the one newspaper that they have at that cafe, or the one that I bought, I can read newspapers from the entire world in the languages that I speak. So I can get, uh, like this morning, I was, I was looking at uh, the UK, at Germany, at Spain, at America, and at Canada. And you know, um, it, oh, and I looked at something from Mexico as well. So I'm not necessarily reading a whole lot of long articles, but it allows me to get a lovely, uh, varied impression of what different countries are saying about different bits are, that are in the news. So of course, much of the news is the same, except from a different vantage point. And that gives me great joy to know that I have this facility thanks to the internet, my mobile devices, and so on. So anyway, that is one of my bits of joy as well. And, um, you know, in, when I wrote that book of mine, that first one, Rewiring the Soul, I wrote this little sentence, which is, the less you love yourself, the more it is likely that you believe someone else holds the key to your happiness unless you love yourself. And of course, if you are producing joy for yourself, or if you are taking joy in small doses every day, several times, you are showing yourself that you care enough about yourself to do this. What proof, if I asked you, uh, prove to me that you love yourself, 
prove to me that you do things that, that, that will tell me, without a doubt, that you love yourself. And you might say, well, you know, I exercise and I eat healthy food and uh, um, I try to be with people that, you know, add to my own energy. Um, those are all very good points. And so is this. Finding joy in your life every single day is something that um, tells me you are invested in this love and this caring for yourself. And, you know, other little examples might be some of you who look at my stuff on Facebook, on my personal Gabriella Korch page, you'll see that I am often posting a virtual latte in some location in the world, some beautiful photograph that I have found somewhere, typically on Instagram, and I then post it. And looking at that photograph gives me, I would say, nearly the same joy as if I were actually in that place, which is why I call it my virtual latte photos. And that doesn't mean for you it has to be that. Obviously, I'm only giving you my own examples, but you can see how other than the coffee at the cafe example, none of these cost any money. Smelling freshly mown grass, hello, and cost a, a cent. I was just smelling the gardenias before I came in to uh, do this Zoom. And uh, before that, um, uh, in the morning when I was out walking, there was another kind of a dama de noche, but not like the ones you see in Spain, and it's not lilac either, but a, a, a flowering bush of that kind with a perfume. I mean, you walk by, you feel joy. So of course, the next time I walk by, I know it's there, so I go for it, and I feel extra joy. <laughs> now, um, one of the things that detracts from our joy is the way we are conscious or not of our thoughts. And we've talked a heck of a lot about thoughts in the past, especially during the course of this pandemic, because so many people have had worry thoughts, fear thoughts, etc. thoughts. But, you know, even on a normal day, let's say you're meeting a friend for lunch and the friend drives up in a magnificent new high-end car put in the brand of your choice and um sorry dry throat dry throat so you look at this car and you know you're the friend of this person that has just driven up you're going to have lunch together but you can feel a little bit of something inside of you or, or maybe you go to their house and they have the most marvelous house that you wish you could have. You know, anything of that type, you know, and, and, and a material thing or a watch, I don't care. But you feel the thing inside that tells you there's a certain twinge of, if you like, jealousy, not jealousy, envy, envy. Um, along with, of course, you're happy for your friend, but you're also envious. And this isn't about, you know, me saying to you, oh, you shouldn't feel envy, you know, don't be such a low character. <laughs> this is nothing to do with morals or ethics or judging your, the state of your character. This has to do with you recognizing what envy does to you, right? Envy, um, hatred, jealousy, anger, so many of these emotions do things to your energy. And so you want to be really aware of when they're happening and you want to have uh, an antidote. And um, the antidote has to typically come from inside your own head because, um, you know, you, you think, think that those thoughts of envy, anger, um, jealousy, hatred, they behave a little bit like bacteria, word that we're using a lot right now, in your body, and they are contagious to your entire system. And furthermore, if you allow thoughts of that nature to... Um, grow progressively in you on different occasions, not just that one time, 
you will also notice that it becomes easier and easier to go down that road. Think of this, for example. If you have a, a friend that you begin to doubt something about that friend because of whatever, something happened. And so you have, or maybe you had a slight argument and now you have thoughts, not only about that argument, but about things that you remember that happened with that friend in the past that you perhaps, you know, didn't pay much attention to. So now you're bringing all of this into your consciousness and you are thinking about it a lot. Guess what happens? Probably you wind up convincing yourself that maybe the friend isn't so wonderful to have in your life or maybe it would be a good idea to see that friend less or not at all and i'm using that as an example regarding the contagion of the thoughts that can go on and on depending on you know how conscious you are of them or not because um it, it is very hard to remain rational and objective uh, uh, neutral about something of this nature that is occurring. So if you feel the jealousy or if you feel the envy or the anger or the hatred, or you're having second thoughts about the friendship or the relationship with whomever, if you feed that, the contagion grows, the virus grows. So don't feed it. And of course, in order to not feed it, you have to tackle it. Um, you know how it is if you have a sharp spot on one of your teeth? Your tongue keeps going to it over and over and over again. And it goes there and it goes there and it goes there. Eventually, your tongue has a little either cut or um, like a little, a little bump because you have put it into that sharp place so many times and now your tongue is extremely sore. So what do you do next? You don't want to hurt your tongue anymore. So you make yourself be conscious at each moment when you go unwittingly with your tongue back to that sharp spot on that particular tooth. I'm sure you can get to the dentist and get it filed down or something. And <clears throat> so you make yourself become conscious of it and in so doing, what do you do? You stop your tongue halfway. And maybe the first 10 times that this happens, you literally have to think about it quite strongly in order to make your tongue go back away from there. But before you know it, you're not going there at all anymore. How simple was that, right? All you had to do was bring a bit of consciousness into the process and you stopped hurting your tongue. And so it is with these contagious thoughts that we can have, low energy thoughts, or convincing ourselves of someone's uh, lack of, of um, uh, the, the, you know, the friend that shouldn't be in our life anymore, because we have allowed those thoughts to can go and go and go, and we never bring up to the surface all the good stuff of that person. So, uh, with joy, <clears throat> you kind of have to do the same thing. <clears throat> so if I'm, if I'm having these envy thoughts back to the person that, you know, showed up in this high end car or they've invited me to their house and it's a new house and it's the most spectacular house I've ever seen. And I'm filled with envy as I become conscious of my envy. And of course, in order to become conscious of my envy, I've got to be doing some of the mindfulness stuff that we also talk about, right? I have to be conscious and aware. I have to be living in the present, even though I may still have thoughts of this nature or reactions of this nature. So if I'm conscious and, and aware um, and mindful, I'm going to recognize in a few seconds that I'm having envy thoughts. At that point, I will do the tongue thing and I will remove my thoughts from there. Or I will tell myself, hey, you don't want to have those thoughts. This isn't, where, this isn't the direction you want to go in with your inside uh, self. And so you make that choice to stop the action of your thoughts in the direction of the envy and you pull back and you either um, 
you know, make yourself uh, think only of how beautiful the house is and how much you're going to enjoy coming to this house because you and the owner of the house are good friends and you're probably going to get invited a lot or you move into another direction. And one of the other directions can simply be love. What do you feel for your friend? You probably feel love for your friend or great caring. Okay, move there. Think about that. And in this process, the analogy of moving the tongue away from the sharp thing in your tooth is going to help you if you do this over and over for each of the negative energy type of thoughts you may have um, or feelings you will create a new way of dealing with all of this and you will be able to move away from it quite quickly. Um, also, I want you to draw into your head the image of small children jumping for joy. Most days I receive a video of my grandchildren jumping for joy, shouting for joy, showing proudly something they've made, um, doing whatever they're doing, with their sports activities, although that's a little more curtailed right now, but still they're, they're doing lots of things. And I imagine all of you have somebody in your family or relations where you know about children jumping for joy, or you've seen it with your own children. But of course, we, you know, we're not children anymore. How many of us are jumping for joy? Even if you play tennis or paddle or any sort of activity where you move around a lot, we, we wouldn't say in any part of that you're, that you're jumping for joy. Rafael Nadal might jump for joy at the end of, you know, the French Open if he wins it. But, but even that uh, is not the kind of jumping for joy that I'm talking about with kids. So, what is it that they have that we don't have anymore? We are paying much less attention to our joys. And one of the reasons we pay a lot less attention to our joys is because we are not as present. As an example, think of a kid sitting in the sand, building a sandcastle. Is the kid thinking about, you know, who did what on Facebook? Is the kid worrying about the kid next to him wearing a bathing suit that cost five times what his bathing suit cost? <laughs> Is the kid thinking about the fact that he had lunch out of a picnic box instead of at that spectacular beach restaurant where the other kid had lunch? No, because they're kids and they are not yet conditioned into those things the way we are, although my examples aren't the best because of course what is keeping you from joy can be much more complicated than these little silly examples I gave. But we, we tend to lose that habit of joy the older we grow. And I'm sure you have seen in the news over the past probably 10 years or so, um, uh, courses in laughing, laugh therapy, risoterapia. And I think it started somewhere in Scandinavia, but anyway, it's kind of all over the world now which isn't exactly joy, but it is something that can lead you to joy as they do these classes with you. So um, anyway, going back to the kids and the jumping for joy, this shows you how wonderful joy can be. This pure, unadulterated uh, happiness that the kids have in the simplest little things that we seem to have lost. Uh, I know many, many people, you know, they, if, if you have a garden, for example, or even if you just have plants on your terrace, you will go to your plants and you will feel something akin to joy as you water them or take care of them or take away the dead leaves or, or, or just look at them because they're beautiful. So you know that kind of joy, but are you also augmenting your joy with other things that are out there for you, such as some of those examples I mentioned? Um, most of you know one of the things that gives me great joy is driving out on a weekend and, and into, the, into the countryside. How much does that cost, right? That's, that's a little bit of uh, petrol in your tank and uh, with a friend or two and then having lunch somewhere in some simple country restaurant etc etc 
these are simple joys. And, you know, depending on where you live and what your particular circumstances are, I, what about playing a game of cards with friends or with family? I, I, personally, gin rummy or rummy coop, which is kind of similar, gives me great joy as long as the mosquitoes aren't biting me, which here, unfortunately, the last couple of uh, days has been tremendous, many mosquitoes. Okay, so um, you, you can think about what you're, put, what you're doing to put joy into your life on a daily basis. And I would suggest you make a list in case you're not doing it often enough. And with your list, you can make yourself, oblige yourself to do some of those every single day. And as you do, you will probably find many more. One of the things that I find gives me enormous joy is going down um, just before sunrise to the beach in order to see that red orb raise its beautiful head above the horizon and begin to ascend into the sky. I mean, it's a question of minutes, literally. And, and it's, it's the same every day, except it's not, right? It's a little bit different every single day. Not to mention the position at which the sun is when it's rising, is so different uh, depending on the season. So, you know, find your own joys, but do it uh, and think of it as this um, uh, vitamin therapy for your soul, for your spirit, for your mind, for your heart. And uh, sort of the last thing I wanted to talk about related to the subject of acquiring joy is, I think we have about 11 minutes left, is, um, you know, when you, when you go through life, especially as you are no longer a child, you begin to see uh, as we've also discussed recently, the number of challenges you may have in your life, and not just this incredibly large one that we have right now, but the challenges that you have um, just you know in your life, whatever they may be. Perhaps you have a, f a, a fraught relationship with a family member, or perhaps someone is ill that you love, uh, gravely ill or perhaps there's a money problem, or perhaps there's a job problem, or perhaps um, you yourself have a health problem. I mean, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on about the kind of issues one could have that we could call challenges, or maybe the challenge is a little bit less um, uh, clear in the sense that you may have an issue with a coworker, and this issue, is creating strife and stress on a daily basis but in order to resolve it um, it's not so clear what you will have to do and so you know anyway so all of this creates quite a bit of turmoil in most human beings so um, your question might be why does this have to happen why can't my life just be like the life of, you know, I remember when I was a kid, every so often uh, I would see sitcoms on, I lived in Canada in those years, a sort of American sitcoms on television of, of um, I think there was one called My Three Sons or The Brady Bunch. My three sons was a dad, I think, who lived alone with his three sons, and the Brady Bunch was a big family. Anyway, uh, and there were others. But it always looked as though those families, everything was perfect. I mean, they had their little things, but it always was wonderful at the end of each episode. And I kind of grew up thinking that everybody else <laughs> out there had that, except for me. And one fine day, of course, I realized that that was so. But this desire to have everything good, going well, smooth, not have to deal with challenges is, is quite human, I think. But at the same time, I ask you, would you ever grow if that's how your life were? And the example, of course, we can use is that of children in school. They love recess. They love playing with their friends. They love the time before class 
even if they're already in the classroom before the teacher gets there or while the teacher is busy with whatever and uh, class order has not yet been brought about. And, and then of course they have to sit still and listen to the class and, and do whatever they're told, not to mention they have to then as they grow a little older, do exams and um, hopefully pass them, have to study for these exams and all of that can be quite hard. But what happens? Even though we may not be uh, in agreement with the current system of education, and there's other systems that are coming into being, the point is, if they didn't do it that way or had not done it that way, those kids would not have learned whatever they learned and been able to move on to the next class and the next class and so on and so forth and get into university and blah, 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 blah. So the same applies in analogous fashion to our lives. And, you know, there's a whole lot of examples I want to point out to you of people who, would you ever choose a difficult thing to happen to you? And these people I'm going to mention, just so you get them into your head for a moment, who knows, you know, I'm sure they didn't choose any of this, but here you go. So um, at the same time, though, I want you to be asking yourself the question, if you wanted to choose in order to, for you to grow to different levels that have nothing to do with normal schoolwork, you'd need to choose to put yourself into a number of situations during your life that will cause you to progress in those directions. And if you're this older and wiser part of you that is seeing these things or that knows about these things, um, would be choosing the experiences for you to go through experiences that are not necessarily a lot of fun and games. Maybe you would choose to live in an orphanage as a young child, like Wayne Dyer, even though his mom was al alive. Maybe you'd choose to get sexually abused, like Louise Hay. Maybe uh, you'd be diagnosed with cancer, like so many people we know, but the example I chose was Kylie Minogue. Or maybe you become a quadriplegic and, and, and after you fall off your horse, like Christopher Reeve, you remember the, the man that played Superman, the actor. Maybe you are repudiated by the husband you love because you cannot bear children, like Soraya of Iran, the empress uh, before Farah Diba. Um, or maybe you develop Lou Gehrig's disease, like uh, Stephen Hawking. Maybe your mother is assassinated in front of your eyes like uh, Pakistan's Benazir Bhutto's son that happened some years ago. Or maybe you get jailed for 28 years for expressing your political opinions um, like uh, Nelson Mandela. Or maybe you get sent to Auschwitz, right? Like um, um, Viktor Frankl. Maybe your husband is decapitated in a high-speed boating accident like Princess Caroline of Monaco. Um, her second husband, or maybe you have to battle drug addiction like actor Robert Downey Jr. or alcoholism like Richard Burton, remember, the married Elizabeth Taylor twi twice, wonderful Welsh actor. Or maybe your young son falls 53 floors from a Manhattan skyscraper like Eric Clapton's son. Or maybe you lose your sister to suicide like Mariel Hem Hemingway. Or perhaps you lose your daughter in a tragic skiing accident like Vanessa Redgrave lost her daughter, Natasha Richardson. Anyway, this list that I chose is mainly based on people you might have heard of so that it becomes more immediate to you. But now you ask yourself, um, if you could choose what happens to you in order for you to learn and grow, do you think you'd choose something like that? And of course, your immediate answer would be never, ever in my right mind would I choose something like that. But if you did choose something like that, wouldn't it have been in order to grow from it? In order to get through this entire kind of experience and then be able to find joy in your life and peace in your life and harmony in your life despite all of that? I mean, that is a huge learning experience. Let me just see what, it's, oh, it's covered up and I can't tell how much time I have left. Okay. Um, we're very short. All right, so um, there, you might remember there was an American couple who lost their child to a drive-by shooting in Italy 10, 12 years ago, this was Maggie and uh, Reg Green. 
anyway, it was nobody's fault. It was, I mean, it was the drive-by shooter's fault, but it was a freak accident. And they chose when their child had died to donate his organs and everything that could be donated to as many children as could possibly use those parts of his body in Italy because it was a way for them to grow beyond the pain of the loss of their child in this horrendous way. And of course, it, it, it helped them deal with it. It helped them um, alleviate some of that pain. And not only that, uh, some years later, I saw them returning to Italy. Oh, this is so emotional. They then were met by all the families and the kids who had survived thanks to that little boy. It's such an emotional thing. So this was their way of learning how to grow through a tremendous tragedy. Um, what about, um, you know, Christopher Reeve and his crusade for stem cell research? Thanks to all that stuff that happened to him. Stephen Hawking's zest for life and scientific discovery. Not because of what happened to him, but despite what happened to him. Or Mandela's goal to end apartheid without anger, revenge, and hatred. Um, and obviously, not everybody does this. A lot of people, when bad things happen, become angry and resentful and hate and so on. But this is what, to my mind, uh, these experiences are good for. And if you look at it from the big picture point of view, when, especially when you've had major things like that in your life, you must find your way back to joy. And for that, you can use some of the tools that I talked about at the very beginning. Anyway, so um, unmute yourselves if you want. We have like less than a minute left. <laughs> um, and I will see you a week from today. Nothing on Monday, nothing because it's a holiday here and nothing on Wednesday because I will still be traveling. Okay, so I'll see you Friday the 29th in, I'll have a different background. <laughs> okay, hope uh, you're all well. I hope you all have a great weekend. And